Hello, and welcome to Eyes on the Prize, What Makes for a Winning Photo. My name is Darian, and on behalf of the Big Picture Natural World Photography Competition, I'd like to welcome you to this live program. I'd also like to welcome our two guests, Joanne MacArthur and Karen Eigner. Karen Eigner, hello. Hello. Karen Eigner is a celebrated photojournalist who has traveled extensively to places like South America, Asia, and Africa in the pursuit of photography. Amidst her travels, she has served as the senior picture editor for National Geographic Kids for nine years. She started kids conservation photography workshops to connect youth to nature with the camera. Karen is a member of the Photo Society, an associate fellow with the International League of Conservation Photographers and a member of Girls Who Click. Her work has been found in many prestigious publications, including National Geographic Magazine, BBC Wildlife and Audubon Magazines. Karen is the grand prize winner of the 2022 Big Picture Natural World Photography Competition. Shown here is Karen's winning photo, Bee Bowling. Joanne MacArthur is the founder of We Animals Media, an award-winning photojournalist and the grand prize winner of the 2021 Big Picture National Natural World Photography Competition. For almost two decades, she has traveled across all seven continents to document the plight of animals and share their stories worldwide. She has authored three books and was the subject of a documentary, The Ghosts in Our Machine. This is Joanne's winning photo, Hope in a Burned Plantation. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. We have an excellent program for everyone at home filled with insight into nature photography, how to navigate the world of photography competitions, and uh, Joanne and Karen will be answering your questions at the end of the live stream. So be sure to ask any questions you might have in the chat or the comments, and we will answer as many as we can at the end of the program. And with that, let's get to it. Okay, so to start, Joanne and Karen, you're both grand prize winners of the big picture competition with storied careers in photography and photojournalism that predate your wins. Why join photo competitions? Do competitions like big picture matter or do they make any difference in real life ways uh, for either the photographers or the subjects they focus on? Yeah, I'll start and they totally do. There are, I think a lot of good reasons to enter your work into competitions. First of all, uh, photography is, can be fairly solitary. Maybe you're working with a few people or an editor or an NGO, but quite often you're really driven to do it and you go out on your own to catch these images. Catch, that's a new one. I don't usually say catch. <laughs> Capture, um, make images, but um, it's a way of building community. It's a way of pulling yourself out of that solitary space into a place where you can learn and uh, entering your images into competitions really helps you do that because it helps you get your personal bar for photography higher and higher and higher. And also, I think another reason to, to enter is that people who do nature photography and animal and environment photography tend to do it because they really care about the subject matter. And we're often you know, trying to uh, help the animals in the frame, the environment that you see, uh, whether it's, you know, the work is political in nature or whether it's just instilling on reverence into, you know, the people who are looking at the image, you want a broad audience for that work. And because then you're going to be influencing a lot more people, you're going to be getting people to care about what you care about, you're going to be um, showing things that need to be seen in the world and so on. And so there were, those are two really good reasons. And I will say that, um, you know, having won some, uh, some awards for my work, the visibility of, of my work and those stories that I care so much has totally skyrocketed. And so I highly recommend entering your work. Uh, Karen, do you wanna to add to that? I think you've got a lot of it covered. Um, I 100% agree. So photo competitions get your work seen by the world and they give, they give your work a platform for exposure you know, if you win. And, you know, I enter competitions sometimes as also just a self challenge, right? It's, it's, um, it's one thing to know that you work for certain publications and, and, you know, you get to say, I work for this magazine or that magazine, but it's, but it's a little bit of a different ball game when your work gets seen by judges and it, um, you know, it keeps me humble and it keeps me working harder, uh, because, Judges are funny, you know, they sometimes they'll go, they'll gravitate to one thing or another and you think, God, my my image was in that magazine or this. How come they didn't they didn't vote for it? 
Um, and that's the beauty of competition. I, I like a little competition. It keeps me on my toes. And it also keeps me talking. Joanne, you talked about, you know, this sort of solo life that we, we lead because we a lot of the work we do is on our own. Um, it keeps me talking to people. It keeps me talking to editors. It keeps me talking to friends. Because when I enter these competitions, I want a little bit of feedback. Like if I think it's a good shot, I'll, I've got a couple peeps that I'll send it to. And if I get a wow, then I know entering this one. It doesn't mean it's going to win. It just means that, you know, someone else thought it was good. So I'm, I'm going to try. Um, and it, it's fun. I mean, it, it, if you go in it without worrying that not winning is going to is some reflection on you, that's, that's the wrong way to go about it. You know, just just think of it as a positive experience. It's a learning experience. And if you win, you get the exposure and some money sometimes. Yeah. If I can add as well, is that it's a good way to practice narrowing down your work and creating stories. Uh, you're forced to do it. You're forced to lend, you know, your most critical eye. And, uh, and we all need to do that because we're all quite emotionally attached to our images. Often we are attached to an almost image. You know, it's a fantastic scene. You almost got it, but you didn't. And so it makes you think a little more critically. You can always show your work to uh, people who know about photography. You might know photo editors or just friends who really like photography. Show that work to them ahead of time. And as Karen said, like get their opinion and that'll sharpen your eye. And, and toughen you up a little bit as well. I mean, I've been shooting for 20 years and I still have a lot of toughening up to do. I'm very attached to my images and it always stings a little bit when I get a critique or a lot, but it's really, really good for you. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. I love hearing how these photo competitions, they're good for conservation, they're good for community. It's, uh, it sounds like a lot of good comes from them. <laughs> Before we talk about what makes for a winning photo, can we hear from each of you personally about why you decided to enter big picture when you did? I'll take that one. Um, I don't have any sexy answer for you other than I saw the deadline coming. I had a picture that I thought was solid and I had entered big picture before and I, I like the contest. I like what it's about. Um, and that's really important in contests. You sort of have to vet them. You know, you, you, I don't enter just any contest just to enter a contest. I enter the contests that cater to the kind of work I do, which is, you know, nature and the, the intersections of, of people and nature. So I'm, I'm there amongst peeps. I'm there amongst my tribe, you know, entering. And so those are, that's big pictures. One of the, one of the couple that I enter, I don't enter that many, but um, yeah, I just, it was, it was coming up and I just decided to enter. I, you know, that's about as simple as it gets. It was different for me because Big Picture was not on my radar. And I will say that I wasn't entering competitions until the last five years, which I strongly regret, regret because it's been very enriching in like every possible way. But uh, Big Picture ended up on my radar because they had an additional focus on women and bringing, you know, more women into these competitions and encouraging and empowering more women to be photographers. Uh, this has, you know, historically been a, a male dominated field. Uh, there are a lot of women photographers out there, but they may feel like they shouldn't or can't or submit or their work's not good enough. So I saw this women's focused approach and I thought that's really great. And like all the more reason for me to support big picture and like get in there. They were even offering a discount and uh, big picture was is offering a discount this year as well. Like I think it's 50% off for women. They really, really want to encourage more women to join. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. A topic that Big Picture and both of you care a lot about is accessibility and having photography be something that is for everyone. So how might people go about taking a winning photo if they're unable to travel globally or might have responsibilities or restrictions at home that prevent them for, from leaving for extended photography excursions? Karen? You know, that's, that's a really good question. And I think it's really important to to let everyone know that you don't need to go anywhere um, to, to make a winning image. And, you know, a perfect example of that is my B picture. It was, uh, I'm, I'm in Texas right now and um, living here right now, and it was in my backyard. And 
I got it by, I, I found the, the situation by accident. I had enough curiosity to stop and see what was going on. I went nowhere for that picture. I didn't even have the gear to make that picture. I had to rent the lens. Um, so you can find gems in situations in your backyard. You have bees and insects and lizards and all these kinds of things in your backyard. Figure out how to photograph them. Take a look at the categories. See if something in your residential world fits those categories. You know, there are a lot of, there are uh, big picture. I don't know the name of the category, but there's where humans and, and animals intersect. Um, there's all kinds of common animals that we never think about. Raccoons, squirrels, all these things a lot of people see on a daily basis in their own backyards. So it's, it's about thinking differently. Take a look at the categories. Think about how you can make something around where you live, because you can, um, to fit those categories and go for it and then try different things in right in your backyard or right in your communities where you live. Yeah, I second that. The stories are everywhere. I focus on animals uh, almost always and, you know, and also the plight of animals and our relationship with animals. And I can find that on this block. There are stories between animals and people and how we keep them, how we use and abuse them, how we revere them, how we rescue them. It's all around us. So so just start and, and don't overthink the starting and the how and the gear. Like, please don't save up your money for the best gear immediately. Like, just get a basic camera and practice, practice, practice. That's how you're going to get better. And um, another way to, to gain access is to uh, call up NGOs who might need your services. They, um, they may need a good photographer to shoot a campaign that they're working on. In the case of the kangaroo image that was, one, was my winning image, um, I called a group in, animal, uh, in Australia called Animals Australia. And um, the bushfires were happening. And I thought, you know, we know billions of animals are dying millions and then eventually the number was three billion animals and uh, and that's a story that really needs to be told not just the story of the humans but the story of animals as well and so i called them and said hey like do you need me can i come and they paid for the flight and they helped me get around so it wasn't a paid gig but it was paid for and that's one of the ways that you can gain access is is partner up uh, with someone in an area who can help get you around and cover some costs and that's actually often how i work you know, I want to add something to, to what you said in what you said, um, Joanne, which was uh, gear. Don't get tied up in gear. You know, a few years ago, one of the winning images at one of the contests was done by a GoPro. So, again, it's about what's in your image. It's not about the gear. You know, of course, there are some kinds of images you can only make with certain gear. But um, go for it. Don't overthink it. I think those are, that's the bottom line right there is don't overthink it, just do it. Yeah. I'm really curious if either of you had had to train your eyes to, to look at something that's more regular, like a squirrel and recognize that as a story and not something that your brain kind of, kind of pushes out as something that's normal or typical. You know, I, I think it's a good question, Darian. Um, I, as Joanne does, we photograph stories. I'm always thinking, what is the story in this picture? So I'm always looking at these weird dynamics between animals and in relationship to the world that they live in. So I, I guess over the years, you could say, yeah, my eye is trained because those are the stories I'm always looking at. I'm looking for those contrasts. I'm looking for those weird moments that, that I have a tendency to see with animals wherever I go, whether it's an animal in some sort of sort of weird industrial scene or some weird moment where there's a monarch butterfly on the ground in front of a dollar general and people are walking out, you know, almost stepping on it as it's, as it's dying because it's been hit by, you know, so it's, for me, it's almost like I can't stop seeing those things, which becomes a bummer sometimes, you know, cause you just want to see the pretty flower. But um, yeah, I think it comes from what interests you also. That's the beauty of uh, really getting deep into photography is that we often see things the way we think the world doesn't, or we take the time to document those things. You know, the butterfly that's dying and everyone's walking past on the sidewalk. 
Well, if we take the time to take those images, more people are going to stop and see as well and think. And, you know, ultimately, I think a lot of conservation photographers, environmental photographers want to increase the empathy in the world. And uh, that comes right back to, uh, you know, entering competitions to get those your point of view seen. And all along the lines of storytelling, which is what we do, I do want to mention captions in submitting images to competitions like Big Picture. You really, really need to have a fantastic caption. We don't, um, I say we don't want to see because I've, I've juried as well, but jurists don't want to see a description of exactly what's in the image. You know, if it's a cow in the field, please don't say this is a cow in the field. We, <laughs> we know. <laughs> We want to know the why you took the picture, why you care about this, what else does it relate to, and uh, and give us some information that will that will inspire us. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's funny how I, I'm now talking from like the the jurist perspective, and Karen, you've done a lot of that as well. I I think well, you have to right. I think I think one of the things is that people don't people think it's it's hard to know what juries are thinking so i think it's helpful to hear what we are thinking when we're looking at those things you know and there's a lot that goes into it and you've got to remember depending who your jurors are some of them like i i worked at nat geo kids magazine i saw millions of pictures of animals and i saw some of the best ones in the world so for me you know when you show me something simple that's just a you know, basic image, I'm like, oh, well, I've seen that. So it, it's, you know, you have to think about your jury and and who you're sort of pitching to, pitching your image to. Um, and I'm sorry if you hear a dog in the background because mine's barking. Anyway. No worries. We appreciate that the, the both sides of your insight as photographers and jurors, it's very helpful, I think, to people wanting to uh, submit their images. You might... This might lead into this next question, which is that people don't often know either what photo to choose when considering whether to enter a competition, or they might think they're not experienced enough to attempt. Could you offer any practical advice for people who may not consider themselves professionals or people who haven't entered competitions before? Is there room in photography competitions like Big Picture for these people? Um. I think Karen's probably more equipped to answer this because she's been, you know, doing this longer than I have. You don't get to cop out. You got to answer first. You just have to do it because my answer is really simple. Like in photography, you're not going to get better by conceptualizing things behind your desk and thinking about it and saving up for gear. You're going to get better by doing over and over and taking like years of crappy pictures and so you need to take years of crappy pictures or, you know, like a thousand pictures to get, you know, the couple that really, that really stand out. So you have to shoot a lot and, and just submit, just submit. And also beyond the competitions, you can submit your work, but I'm repeating myself a little, like, um, you know, have a photo community, whatever your photo community it is, show it to friends, submit it to portfolio reviews. Um, get it under the nose and eyes of of just about anyone. Uh, those are the ways that you're gonna gonna grow quickly. <laughs> but I feel like I'm repeating myself. So <laughs> um, I can add to that a little bit, and um, so you don't have to be a professional to win something. And you, but what you do have to begin to understand is what makes a good picture. So uh, one way to do that is to take a look at what's winning. Take a look at the winners of big picture in the past. Go back five years, look on their website, see what's winning the portrait category and the winged life category and, and whatever categories there are. And then take a look at your own work and, and be honest with yourself. I mean, one image that you look at that wins over here might be epic and fine. Maybe you have something that's, that's not that epic, but but it's kind of cool. So you can still submit it, why not? But goes back to what Joanne said, I would highly recommend if you're serious about not just competitions, but your own work. If you are striving to be better at photography as a photographer, it's essential that you, you go to portfolio reviews. There are lots of editors out there who do private portfolio reviews and they will give you feedback. They will tell you what works, what doesn't work, or they'll help you through it. And if part of what you wanna do is submit to contests, 
you can go to them, especially the ones who have experience judging the contest because they're really good at helping, right? Because they know the ins and outs of the contest. So they can, they can really be helpful in telling you what, what the jurors are thinking, what editors are thinking. So, you know, if it's important to you and you really care about, you know, getting better and winning, you know, pay them for an hour's worth of time. And, and get your work in front of them. That's, that's if you're not part of a, a professional community and you're not, you know, a professional photographer, you can still seek those people out and pay them for an hour of their time. You know, they, they cater to anybody who wants to become a better photographer. But again, it's, it's really, um, you know, you got to ask the hard questions about your own work. And that's what you need to do if you want to get better. And it also helps you understand what is a better picture, what, why, you know, there's all kinds of things that go into them, you know, but um, the more you look at it, the more you start to see, oh, wow, okay, there's a foreground, a middle ground and a background and they all matter. And in my picture, there's just one thing in the middle, you know, and that's how you start being honest with yourself and getting better. One um... Uh, one great way to get better if you're starting out or you don't consider yourself as a as professional is to look at all of the winning galleries over the years and why are they winners and imitate them. I certainly learned by having a roster of favorite photographers and I wanted to do exactly what they were doing. And, and I was following the photojournalists and the conflict photographers and I was looking at how they use their wide angles and how they got close and when does it matter if something's blurry and, and what, when doesn't it and when does it matter and uh, composition. So I just studied and studied by looking at picture books and looking online and imitating. And from there, I developed my own way of seeing and doing. But uh, I think it's perfectly okay to, to learn by imitating and practicing in that way. However, what sometimes is seen in competitions is that you have a couple of styles that are prominent in a competition. And then in the following two or three years, competitions receive a lot of images that look like that. <laughs> that's not a way to win a competition. It's a great way to practice and it's a great way to get great pictures for yourself, but it's not a great way to, to ensure you're, you know, getting into the first, second and third categories. We want to, you know, we in big picture and competitions want to see images that are unique and, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the one of the questions always is, you know, like what do what do judges want to see? And I'll tell you flat out, I want to see something that makes me say wow, that stops me in the tra my tracks, and I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing. Like that's that's how simple it is. I don't I don't you know, deconstruct an image and say, Ooh, that's a little crooked. And this could have been, you know, I do that later, but if there's an image that just pops, it's like, Whoa, immediately goes to the next round. Like th that's, that's how simple it is. Right. And if I don't get that little bit of interest from myself in an image, then it, then it goes to the other side, you know? So that's, you know, we'll talk about it later, but that's where your image needs to have a little bit more something, something kind of thing. Yeah, it's so interesting to hear how it's an art form that can be so cerebral and thought out, but if it lacks kind of this guttural sense about it, um, yeah. it's, it's not the, the complete thing. Um, but that brings us to the big question of the night, the name of the program. What makes for a winning photo? I know you've, each of you have chosen some photos of past winners or photos of your own that you love or you'd love to talk about. And... Um, Let's, let's look through some of those now. We're gonna start with uh, Joanne's selections. So here we have Dancing Bears, which is the 2022 human nature, which was a, a 2022 human nature finalist in the big picture competition by David Hupp. Well, the reason, one of the reasons I picked this image is that I'm particularly excited about how um, typical styles of photojournalism are really entering into and growing in the nature and environment competitions. Uh, from what I hear, this category, uh, human and nature or photojournalism in general, is the fastest growing category uh, in competitions. It happens to be what I, what I do, which is, you know, why I'm so passionate about this kind of work. But, um, you know, this is a, 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 a category where 
we are seeing the inevitable interactions that are happening with animals in the, in the environment globally. Like nowhere in the world can animals really get away from our influence of some kind, even if it's, you know, climate change and, and so on. But then you have really direct relationships with animals like this really unusual image. Now, of course, I find it fascinating that this is usual for this community and it's this bear festival and they're wearing bear costumes, which, you know, some of them are, are maybe all of them are taxidermy and they are actual bears is what the, the caption says. And so this is natural for this community, but really extraordinary for the world to see. And to me, it brings up important questions, which is what I love about the photojournalism categories is, um, you know, about our relationship with with animals, our uses, our sharing of spaces, and calls into question those practices. Uh, I I do enjoy this image because of those, like the coloring really, and that bear on the right really stands out. And uh, anyway, in some ways it's almost like a snapshot, but uh, in other ways it's still a winning image. It, it says a lot. Karen, do you wanna mention anything or shall we go to the next one? No, I mean, I, I, it's definitely intriguing to look at and begs a lot of questions. Um, and this, you know, I think this is a really good example of there, there really needs to be a good caption with this because we need to understand what's going on. I think, Joanne, you, you know, I, I agree. I think those are taxidermy bears. And I think that kind of information is super, super important to this kind of an image. Um, because in, it, when I first look at it, I'm thinking, oh, those are costumes. And then part of me is going, wait a minute, are those real bears? And I can't 100% tell because they might be really good costumes, but that caption will, will clarify that kind of thing. And that's the kind of thing mm -hmm. where instead of saying, oh, there are bears with red scarves on them, you, you talk about these are real bears, you know, yes. so that's, that's what this image, I think is a perfect example of what you mentioned before, which is the captions need to be really good and really well thought out. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Knowing that they are real bears, that these bears have been killed for this purpose, you know, takes this image to the next level and frankly makes my jaw drop. Yeah. Great. Now this next image is by Aaron Jakoski, who has spent a lot of time photographing uh, sea otters who are used as pets and in entertainment. And this is quite the opposite of that last image. Uh, it's one of the big picture winning images, again, in the uh, human and nature category. And, um, you know, this is very, uh, very simple and stark in some ways, uh, a very calm image compared to the last one. But what I find extraordinary is this wild animal indoors with a child, um, seemingly very comfortable in a home. And again, this I think it's beautifully composed, but I like what, um, what it brings up. And in fact, this entire story that he's put together um, tells a bigger picture and, and is quite gorgeous. So uh, yeah, again, I'm really happy to see uh, these animals that call into question our, our relationships with uh, other animals. You know, I, uh, I wanna add that um... What's interesting to me about this image is it's not the norm, right? We don't see the otter's face. It's because I, I can already hear people saying, well, it's a silhouette. You can't see the face. Like, why is that interesting? It's interesting because it's a completely different perspective on something, right? We could have, someone could have photographed this with the otter sitting on the couch and the little kid sitting on the couch. And that would be one way of photographing it. But this is a different perspective that is not the obvious perspective. So again, that that's something that'll trigger a judge like, whoa, it's that question of, okay, so I might not be going, wow, I might be going, wait, what am I looking? Oh my gosh, oh wow. You know, so the wow comes a little bit later, but you've now caught my attention because it's, it's not obvious. Now I have to look at this picture and go, wow, this is really amazing that he thought, you know, maybe he didn't even think to backlight it. He didn't think that far because sometimes we don't. Right. But we just we we see something come together and we're like, oh, my God, that's that's so amazing. You can't explain it in the moment, but you see the light in the dark and the shapes and you shoot it. Um, and sometimes that's how it happens. It's not, you know, the, these journalistic images a lot of times are not overthought. They're in the moment and you have to be brave enough 
to capture them. And you also have to be able to see what's happening, right? And and avoid the the desire sometimes to to do it more obviously, you know, be not obvious. It, it makes for a really, you know, wow image. Mm -hmm. The real reason I'm joining you all tonight is so I can listen to Karen talk about pictures. It's like one of my favorite, my favorite things. This is so great. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Definitely appreciate it. And there's a lot more to talk about. So this next image was actually the 2019 grand prize winner. It was the photo title is called Black Grouse Showing Off by Audrey Richardson. Yeah, I wanted this in our talk tonight. You know, there's a lot of talk about bird on a stick, which is which is a little derogatory, you know, typical bird on a stick. But and we're going to show more images of, of birds. But um, on but congratulations to this image for being so incredibly dynamic. You know, birds are often shot with a 600 mil or, you know, a really long lens. But here we are with a wide angle and the focus is fantastic. You have that sunlight, you have, you know, the spread wings and that crest and that eye in focus, that that splendor of the background, like, come on, like, this is just absolutely an award-winning image. And I'm really glad it's here tonight because now you all get to see it if you haven't seen it yet. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I have to laugh at bird on a stick because that's <laughs> one of my phrases and all my students know it, it's a big joke. Um, but, the goal, right, for any photographer is, is do the bird on a stick differently, okay? So if it's a tiger in the forest, do it differently. If it's a sea, if it's an otter in a house, do it differently. And this image, this image gives you sense of place. It puts that animal in its environment. And what I really like about this image is that the animal's not looking at me. It doesn't know I'm there. And, and that I love is that because I feel like I'm just get a I get to look into his world and be part of it, but not bothering him at all. He's doing what he would do without a human present. And I and I, it's just it's you know you can't you can't make this happen, right? Um, you can find the location, you can hope the bird shows up, but the key and this this goes into a whole different thing of like, if you're going to photograph wildlife and animals, um, you need to learn behavior. You need to learn how they act, what they're doing, when they're going to do it, so you can be ready to capture it. Now, I don't know the backstory on this. I don't know if it's a, if, if he was there or firing remotely, or if it was a camera trap, but regardless, this moment is, is epic. It, it really is. And, and not only is the moment epic, you know, I, I'm always talking about composition and lines. His wings fit perfectly into the mountain range. Nothing's crossing over. There's no, there's no crossing lines. So, I mean, my gosh, you know, how do you make this any better? Um, and, and the funny thing is I hadn't seen this image um, until, you know, we, we were preparing for this, but I hadn't, this one escaped me. And I, I think it's quite fabulous. It's a quite fabulous bird on a stick. So there are amazing birds on stick pictures. You just have to go out and make them. Hmm. Something about competitions is that uh, if you get it, get to the final round, they will ask for your raw images, your original images. And um, they may ask for images on either side of that as well. If there's something that seems like it, you know, it might possibly be photoshopped. You never, ever, ever, you know, alter your image. And I can even imagine them asking for this one, like, can we see the raw? Yeah. Um, because as you said, there are no crossing lines with those wings. The wings are not dipping into the mountains. Like what an absolute moment captured. Right. And, um, and yeah, sometimes they'll ask for the series, um, you know, to, to check for authenticity. No, no, this is a really beautiful image. It's very yeah. well executed. Absolutely. Okay, Karen, let's go into some of your, your choice pictures. Up first, we have uh, Caught by Cats, which was a 20, which was the 2020 Human and Nature category winner by Jack Wonderly. So, you know, one of the reasons I like this image is because I almost feel like it's a studio shot. It's one of those shots where you're like, okay, it's on white background. But for me, there's something just 
beautiful about the symmetry. And then when I found out what it was about, boom, then you have me, right? Because so again, back to the caption, this is this is one of these storytelling images, which on the front end might look like, okay, like I said, just a studio shot of, you know, dead birds. But I just feel like it's so artfully done and so well executed and just perfectly lined up to show a really, really sad story. So um, it, it just, it caught my attention the first time I saw it. I saw it years ago and um, it just, I was like, wow, I wish that was my image. And sometimes I do, I see some of these images that people make and I'm like, I wish that was mine. I wish I was in that situation or I wish I'd thought about it. Um, but I've, I've always liked this image. Um, there's so much heart and sorrow in it that the yeah. photographer went to pains to work with someone, presumably to like collect these these birds. Um, were they working with an NGO? Were they working with a campaign to you know to to get this image out in the world to educate people about you know the destruction that outdoor cats bring to wildlife? My hope is that this was part of a big campaign. Um, and I mean, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, I just want to make these a five by seven postcards with a caption on the back and put them in the mailboxes of all of my neighbors and <laughs> all the ones who have their cats outside and just like drop this in it. You know, it's 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 heartbreaking and inspiring. And you you want to like, you know, look at and care about these beautiful birds and wonder why they're dead. And then you flip over the postcard or you read the caption or you read the campaign line and it says, you know, uh, killed by cats and it's really impactful. I, that's a fabulous idea, Joanne. And part of me wants to ask Jack if he's done that because I think it's an amazing, amazing concept. And it could, it definitely will make people look and think. I, I really do. And this is one of those images that, you know, you understand, you've heard about cats and cats killing wildlife and all that. But, you know, I know a lot of people out there who have outdoor cats and then they're, they love birds. But I think going back to how impactful something could be. Um, if they saw their favorite bird in this pile, if they love woodpeckers, even though they have cats outdoors, they might start to rethink some of it, you know, and rethink actions. So this is one of these images that, you know, used, it can be used really to, to try and change things for the better for, for wildlife. Absolutely. All right, what's the next one? So up next, we have uh, Shooting Star, which was a 2022 Aquatic Life finalist by Tony Wu. So I've, I've seen this image now in a couple contests. And the one thing about winning images is they, they need to have longevity. They need to be able to, they, they have to stay the course. And, you know, the first time I looked at this, I, I didn't pay much attention. And then the second time I was like, wow, what is going on? And then I, it's, it's, this is a, a, a mating um, uh, endeavor here, what's going on. And, a spawning, uh, spawning event. Spawning event. Yeah. Sorry, not mating, spawning. And um, I, it's, and then it has this artistic quality for me that's almost like a painting. So every time I look at this, I just, I get, I get brought back in. I see something a little bit more or a little bit different. Um, so for me, it's just, it was, it's just that impact right away where I'm like, wow, what's going on here? This is super cool. I've never seen, you know, a starfish spawning like this, but I don't, I don't even get spawning immediately. I get something out of like um, Avatar or a movie scene. It's celestial. Yeah. There's, there's just something for me that that's beautiful about it that I've not seen before. And like I said, I've seen lots and lots of underwater picture, lots of animals pictures, but I have never seen it composed like this with the colors and the movement um, that's within this. So well done to Tony for sure. Yeah, it's it's completely extraordinary. The colors are seem surreal, but they're real. And it transports you into literally another world, the world that so few of us have access to underwater. And it's an example of the distances that some photographers will go to to capture an image that uh, they want to show to the world. So, you know, not all of us uh, can scuba dive and have, you know, the the gear to go underwater and all, and all this. It's an example of a photographer really going out of their way 
to get an image, but that also leads to the upcoming images that we want to show you about how you can shoot in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's go to the next one. So this next one is the Bee Eaters and the Agave Flower, which was okay. a 2020 Winged Life finalist by Salvador Colve Nebo. Okay. So again, we're back to birds on sticks, right? So this, this is a theme here now tonight. Um, I, I think this is a beautiful image. It's, it's very artistic. It feels painterly to me, like, like this was painted in watercolor. And the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it also was because it's, it's a different perspective, you know, let it, allowing the, the background to blow out, overexposing it, and, and thinking about the design of the image. But for me, if the bird, if, in the, in the, if the bee eater in the lower right-hand corner didn't have his wings up, it wouldn't be the same image. I probably would have passed on it. Um, but with the wings up, it gives it that extra thing, that, that one step further where you're like, wow, something's holding me in here. And um, so for, for all of you who might not be professionals or think you don't know, um, you know, what a good image is or what to submit, start thinking about your images in that way. If you have a common scene, what's the next step? What's the next better image you can make out of that scene? And if it's a scene that you, you know, that it, that you are shooting in your backyard or in your community, and once you start to learn the behaviors of what the animals will do, then you can be ready for it. You can find the, the tree that you like. You can find the tree with the cool shape, go to it every day, once a week, whatever, and see how the birds operate in there. Because if this is a tree that bee eaters love, then you can go back again and again and again. And then you're waiting for that extra moment. You've got the shot where they're all sitting on there, right? You, you've got the shot where they're all perching. And then, you know, the 500th time you've seen it gets kind of boring, right? You, you already have a million of those shots. And then one raises its wings, bingo. Or, and then one flies in, you know, or, or they fight, or there's some action going on. So those are the things you're looking for in your pictures. Amen, sister. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be funny if this uh, this was actually a really cloudy day and usually the background is like an apartment building or something. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it would be. <laughs> but yeah, you have to go back, go back to your spots, get to know what the, the fauna is doing. And and um, sometimes that's how you're going to get a grand, a grand yeah. prize winner. Yeah. Definitely. So I think up next we have some shots from Karen... Just we have more birds on sticks. All right. So just a, just a little quickie session on, all right, let's say you've gone to Africa. These are in Africa. Um, you've gone to Africa. You really, really want to submit to the winged life category. And the only thing you have are your, I, I don't even remember the name of the species. It's some sort of go away bird. Um, that's what they're, that's what they're called. It's a different, um, different species of it though, um, or a different, Anyway, I don't remember the name of it. But anyway, it's on a stick. You got another bird on a stick. You've got hundreds and hundreds of images of this bird on a stick. And as you can see the top rope, it is a bird on a stick. It's just sitting there, right? So you go through and then you get to the lower left-hand corner. He's raising his tail. So we got a little bit of something more going on there. And then that one that I circled, boom, you've got a little bit of action. So you could say to me, well, no, I, I think the bird on the stick, you know, the upper left-hand corner is better. So, but I'm going to say, wait a minute, let's process these out. Let's crop them a little bit, make them, make them tight and solid. So let's go to the next frame. And there you go. So for me as a judge, I look at the bird on the stick and I'm like, well, what is this person trying? And these are my pictures. So I get to like totally, you know, critique them. Um, that's the, the, a bird on a stick. And I'm like, what's the person trying to tell me? I've seen a million birds on sticks that look like this, you know, and there's nothing amazing about my bird on the stick, zero. Now, the one on the left has a little bit of action. It's got a little bit of behavior. That picture automatically becomes stronger than the bird on the stick, in my opinion, okay? So it is subjective, but for me as a judge, I would be looking more for the picture on the left than the picture on the right. Because the picture on the right, I've seen a million times in a million different versions. And you're really going to have to have something special for me to look at a still bird on a stick like that with a just sort of banal sky in the background. But 
the action will help me look at it again, right? I'll look at it a little bit closer. So that's, that's the quick and dirty of birds on sticks and how to make them a little bit more interesting. You put or, together like, winner, you know, go ahead, Joanne. Sorry. I'm just going to say you put together another example of the four with, I think it's a lynx. Yeah. It's, uh, let's go to the next one. Right. So here's, let's say there's a portrait category, right? And these are my Bobcat pictures and they're all just pretty boring, straightforward portraits. And I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure that I would submit any of them, um, you know, at least not the three that don't have the red square around them, right? You've got portraits staring at the camera, portraits staring at the camera, portraits staring at the camera. So the upper left-hand corner has staring at the camera, but the arm in the air. So immediately that image becomes more interesting to look at. So when you're looking at your own pictures, be honest with yourself, like, we're all emotionally connected to our birds on sticks or our bobcats sitting on tables, but are those winning images? And that's the question to ask yourself. And if it's, if it's a place where you can go back somewhere not far away, then you can look at the first set of image you have. And if you don't have that extra something, something in there, go back, watch it again, see if you can get it grooming itself. Maybe it has kittens that are jumping on it. Maybe you use panning slow, you know, motion, slow your shutter speed down to get it a little bit artistic, right? Then you're starting to make something common, more interesting to look at using different techniques or waiting for some behavior that you haven't yet captured. So that's what I have to say about that. Excellent. I'm not going to add because we have 14 minutes left. Okay. And yeah. we have questions yeah. and there's a few more amazing pictures to mention. Yeah. So this next uh, image that we're going to look at is uh, the 2021 Art of Nature winner. It's called Goblet of Fire by Sarang Naik. And he was shot right near his home in the countryside in India. It's a great example of not having to travel far to shoot the photograph. And also just seeing something differently. Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's just completely different and it's in a category where you're allowed to be completely different, right? Art of nature. So bring on a new perspective as a judge. You want to, you want to just blow someone away with something they haven't seen before. And this is super, super different. I've never seen this before. And then when you read the caption, you're going to have even more information about it. And you know, that's, this is a perfect example of not going far. And you don't always get to an opportunity to play with light if you're moving quickly doing animal photography or nature photography. But this seems to me like an instance where you can go back and back, you can shoot at night, you can, you know, set up strobes or a simple, you know, phone camera, I guess we can go to the next image and, uh, and create something spectacular. Yeah. Also, like if you're if you're shooting macro, you don't need to buy a macro lens, you can buy like macro screw on Oh, yeah, screw on things to your lenses. And that's actually what I do. Uh, it's so much fun. It's a lot cheaper. Good to know. Um, but yes, you mentioned this next image, which was a 2016 Art of Nature finalist. It was shot by a 17-year-old um, Axel Boberg in his backyard. The light that we're seeing was actually the flashlight from an iPhone. Yes. And that's part of why we wanted to show this. Uh, I think they titled it Greenpeace, which is, which is just lovely. Yeah. And an example of what you can do if you have a tiny space out back or in the local park. I mean, how extraordinary. This is not how we see trees uh, or leaves when we're out walking and not paying attention. And it just um, reminds us of the beauty of the world. It's heart shaped too. I mean, it's just, it's just so lovely. <laughs> and, and these are simple tools, you yeah. know, your flashlight or your your headlamp or you know get creative backlight things think about where you can put light it, it's you know the it the 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 world is sort of a palette and as as if you can start to see differently think about how you can show people things again i mean i feel like i'm repeating myself show people things in a different way and you don't need to go crazy. You don't, like Joanne said, you don't need to buy a whole bunch of complicated stuff. Sometimes it's simple as your iPhone and a light. So. Yeah. I shot for years in my dad's old Minolta before I even got my first camera. Yeah. <laughs> the final image that we're looking at today was the, or is the 2020 grand prize winner, big picture, uh, 
comically titled Hairball by Andy Parkinson. <laughs> and this is an example of maybe a more ordinary animal, but an extraordinary photograph. Gosh, it speaks for itself. Yeah. One thing that I that for me makes this extraordinary is you can tell the animal has been there for a while because of how you know the the snow has frozen and settled and they've moved and so it cracks. And to me, this animal looks like a globe, looks like the entire world, and to me seems symbolic as well, like the fragility of this sweet animal, but of the globe itself. Um, that's what it conjures for me. And the crack makes crack. me think, you know, yeah. we have to protect, we have to protect the small and we have to protect, protect everything and uh, yeah. the world in its entirety. Agree hundred percent. And you know, this image is, again, it's a, it's a common subject, right? But the photographer went out in, in harsh conditions and went to see what they could find. We, we've seen these rabbits or these hares, you know, in the spring eating a flower, but have we seen them in the snow? Not so much, not like this, right? Very few people will go out when it's pouring rain um, or, or temperatures below zero, even in their own backyards. But when you do, if you're going out to make pictures, there are pictures out there. And I am the first one not to go outside when it's freezing cold, but I always kick myself because so many times I, I'll see people posting, you know, on Instagram or whatever. And there's these cool shots of birds with frozen leaves. And I'm like, why didn't I go out? You know, so you just got to get out into the world around you and, and look at what's out there in a different way. Talking about these images, you know, yes, we want to inspire you to submit your work to competitions, but like, we also want you to be inspired to just get out there, just get out there with the gear that you have and have fun. I'm looking at these last few images and they're just so joyous and being a photographer and trying to be a photographer is such a joyous pursuit and it's such a great creative outlet. And the more you do it, the better your images are, <laughs> are going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And be curious, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's how I found the bees. There were little volcanoes on the road, like little sand volcanoes. I thought, what am I looking at? I almost did not stop because I thought, oh, it's just ants, you know, and I, I was just going to go on my way. Not that ants are uninteresting, but I wasn't interested in stopping at that moment. And then I thought, oh, these are bees, which brought me to researching them, finding out really cool stuff about them, and then deciding to go back. Um, so you don't get any of that if you're not in the world, like Joanne said. You're not out there connecting, just being in nature and watching what's going on around you. Definitely. Okay, great. That was our final image to review. And now we will enter our audience participation part of the program. I would like <laughs> to remind all of our viewers at home to uh, ask questions in the comments and we'll get to as many as we can in the seven minutes remaining. Um, let's see. Christina F. asks, I want to start a project that involves many angles, animals, pollution, people, but they haven't yet started because they don't know where to start. Mm. Well, commendable project. That's great. And, and do it. But I think um, when you don't know where to start, uh, don't overthink it. Just start somewhere because when you start, stories will, um, will unfold. And, you know, so your story is, has many facets, but let's say, you know, it starts with uh, humanity, one person. Uh, in my case, let's say I'm photographing an animal industry. Well, there are workers who are there. Who are the workers? Just go, you know, and I might go and start and talk with people who work at farms. They're fascinating people. Why are they there? What's the work like? What's the relationship with, you know, the animals they're working with? And, um, and then you get going, then you get moment momentum. And so I would say, if you don't know where to start, start with the easiest, most close by simple aspect of the story and things will start moving. And start with something that interests you, like, you know, that you are really curious about something that, you know, you're, you, you want to spend time with. Um, I think that's really important in the beginning, you know, um, I, I used to have certain things I loved in the beginning and that's all I wanted to spend time with. And then I ended up spending time with an animal that I really wasn't interested in, but then became very fond of the more that I learned about them. So that's sort of the opposite of what I'm telling you, but, um, I would definitely in the beginning, find something that you really want to spend time photographing 
and learning that. I remember some advice from way back when um, from a Magnum photographer I was interning with. And I said that I wanted to go to Afghanistan because I was very interested in conflict photography. And he's like, Joe, that's not you. And I was really pissed off with that answer, but it was true, damn it. <laughs> and he said, you know, do what you love and do what you know, and you have a lot of those things. So what are those things? And it, you know, he was right. And uh, I ended up pursuing telling the stories of animals and I've been doing that for 20 years and it just made a lot more sense for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Fishy Flakes asks, what is the difference between one competition and others? What should I look for in order to know whether to avoid a contest or not? Um, that's that that goes down a really big rabbit hole. Um, some of the important things for me are the right grabs um, for images. So you want to you want to go all the way down to the bottom or where they have the fine print that says what they will be doing with your pictures. So sometimes the words royalty free, in perpetuity, um, indemnity, indemnify us kind of thing. You want to pay attention to that language. So I won't participate in contests that are allowed to use my images for whatever they want forever and ever and ever and ever. And you have to be very careful of that language and really find it and really read it. So for me, that's that's one thing that's very, very important um, and separates, you know, one contest from another. I'll leave it at that. That's a great answer. And there are a few more questions, I think. Yes. Um, Aria N asks, how did you both first fall in love with photography? Or were you always interested in the field or how did you come to find it? Do you have a couple hours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, four more minutes. Uh, I, I can answer. I can answer real quick. So, I started out traveling. Right. Um, I grew up overseas. I I had a camera because my dad gave me one. I wasn't interested really in photography. It didn't. It wasn't like that. I didn't go to school for it. But one day we came back from traveling, my friends and I, and we sat in a in a room in suburban Connecticut. And we did a slideshow for our parents. And my best friend at the time, her mom, started crying. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. On the screen was a picture of a, of a Thai woman, an older woman with a really wrinkled face. And she was leaning against another, a little boy, could have been her grandson, could have been her son. And I had been in that moment, me on top of the mountain, you know, meeting these people. And I'm looking at her crying and I'm going, what, what's going on here? Like, why is she crying? I, I couldn't understand. The woman had never left the country. She'd never been overseas. So this was very perplexing to me until something clicked and I realized a picture that I took on the other side of the world is making someone feel something. And for me, that's when it changed. I was like, that's pretty powerful. This is pretty cool. So that's for me started the beginning of, you know, getting into photography because of the power of images and what I could do with those images. And then it turned into, I'd always loved animals. So it was the stories I could tell. And I didn't learn all that right away. It was a journey, but that's how, that's how it became important to me, photography. Mm, that's a great story. Uh, <laughs> For me, it was two things. The camera, I see the, cast, the camera as my all access pass into the lives of others. I love being behind a camera and being small, but like asking questions, who are you? What are you doing? People like to talk about themselves and I'm really curious about people in the world. And so that's, uh, that's how I use the camera. And I also love the camera because it's a tool for change. That's also how I use the camera all the time. It's a very mighty and influential tool. Uh, it has the power to influence millions of people and change policy and all sorts of things. There are a lot of animals and stories that need to be exposed and shared and thought about. And, and, uh, and that's also the main reason I, I love photography. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. So our final question for the night, um, Yvette asks, uh, as an emerging photographer who wants to tackle larger projects, how can you gain confidence in yourself? Mm -hmm. That's like a, a barrier for you. You just do it. You, you really, I mean, look, you, if you don't go out and make the mistakes, you never learn, you never get better 
and you never get more confident about your work. You're going to mess things up in the beginning. You're going to you're going to use the wrong settings. You're going to wish you had done something different. But until you go out and do that, you won't have that experience in order to get better and to become more confident and to get uh, just build up your your strength and your confidence. Another thing that you can do is if you're worried, it depends what you're worried about too. Like, are you, what are you not confident about? You know, being, being able to get the picture, photographing it right, being able to use flash. If it's being able to use flash, that's easy. You can go out and practice in your backyard. So there are, there are some things you can do before you go out. And then of course, there's some things you can't until you just go out and try it and, and get the experience. A quick, quick story. I used to, um, I used to shoot weddings, but the first I, and I, I was an assistant for a wedding photographer. And the first one I ever shot on my own came to me through my mom. Her friend had been married several times and she wanted to have photographs again. And I thought, Oh my God, I can't do this, but she loved it. And that's when I got the confidence. I was like, wait, I could do this by myself. She was actually happy with it. I was very critical. And I was like, I please, please, please hope she likes it. And she did. And I was like, Oh wow, that feels good. You know? So it's, it's, a combination of things, but you can't get the confidence until you go out and do things. You have to practice. That's all there is to it. You don't pick up a guitar and imagine that you're going to be able to play a song in half an hour. Exactly. You need to make a lot of terrible sounds before you can make some nice sounds. And it's the same with photography. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect description. A perfect way to close. And with that, tragically, this conversation mm -hmm. has to come to an end. But thank you so much, Joanne and Karen, for sharing your insight and all of your thoughts with us. And thank you to everyone at home who joined us. If this discussion has inspired you to enter the big picture natural world photography, sorry, big picture natural world photography competition, or if you'd like to learn more about big picture, you can do that at www.bigpicturecompetition.org. Good night, everyone. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.